Hi, I'm Tara Majesta. I'm a principal research scientist at Amazon Web Services, and I'm going to talk to you today about longitudinal modeling and quantifying change. This is just a brief outline of my talk. Um, first, I want to address just the basic differences between cross-sectional and longitudinal design. This comes up a lot, and people have very strong feelings about longitudinal versus cross-sectional design. So it's important to, to have a clear understanding of what questions can be answered with different, these different methods. I'm gonna talk about which developmental types of questions can be answered using different models with longitudinal design. Talk about these statistical models that are commonly used in this field and then describe what the state of the art is for fMRI software packages and tools to answer these questions. And then I'll talk about what you can do if, uh, if you call it longitudinal analysis at the edge, what, what you can do if you want to just go off grid a bit and try running analyses with R. Basically, the fundamental difference between cross-sectional and longitudinal design is that a cross-sectional study looks at participants um, at different ages all at the same time. Um, now you can vary this a little bit and you can do some sort of mixed designs with cohort longitudinal types of, of uh, studies, or you look at some cohort of people a few times and then they overlap with another cohort of, of people at different ages. But let's just keep it simple and think about cross-sectional versus longitudinal. Longitudinal um, methods uh, will follow the same participants across multiple time points. This slide just highlights what these differences are. Suppose you have some sort of measure that changes with age um, and you're trying to get a grip on that. A cross-sectional design might, uh, like as on the left, be looking at the, the measure, that measure for participants observed at different ages. And although you can draw a line through that, that tells you nothing about the processes that occur within any individual. So to illustrate that, if we take that same graph, when we look on the right-hand side, um, you could see that uh, I've sort of sketched in what potential individual trajectories might look like. And um, there's a huge amount of nuance in the differences between those individuals. And you could see that um, what looks like a simple linear type of relationship might actually not be that at all in any one individual. So basically the reason that you conduct a longitudinal study is to examine the form of this longitudinal change or, or growth to understand what these curves look like and also primarily how they are related to other variables of interest. You can't measure longitudinal change without having certain elements in your study. Um, the first, perhaps obviously, is that you need longitudinal data. You need to follow individuals at multiple points in time. You also need a sensible measure for time, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. You need enough occasions to examine the correct form of growth. So for example, um, uh, three occasions of measurement allows you to examine linear growth and more is better. Why can't you look at linear growth with just two measurements? Well, for one thing, uh, you wouldn't know what happened in between those two measurements. So it could be a line, it could be anything else, and you have no way of examining that form. But also, perhaps more important, is that you're confounding the measurement error at both occasions with the actual growth. So you, you basically, three occasions allows you to fit a linear model. And you need, as I'll talk about, to find the right statistical models to map onto your developmental question. And that's the topic that is the main focus of this lecture, to give you an overview of these. First, let's talk just a little bit more about time. This may seem obvious, but the timing and the frequency and the spacing of your measurements should be driven by a theory that you have about change. Otherwise, uh, you risk missing the form of change entirely. For example, if your spacing of these measurements is too far apart. Uh, if, for example, you're studying some phenomena in adolescence where there's a very rapid period of growth, if you don't sample often enough, um, you may just reach the beginning and the end and have no um, idea of what happens in between, which is the question of interest. 
if you space things too close, uh, you may be dominated by reactivity, but basically, or by error, by, by uh, practice effects, by any sort of things that you don't want to see. For, for example, in longitudinal studies that I did of aging, um, we always had people who came in and they had studied particular tests, um, for example, word fluency tests, and they had all their S words ready to go. And um, it, it was an issue that doing this too often um, and too close together would be dominated by these practice effects. So things like that are pretty important. The coding of time should make sense. So for example, if you're collecting assessments at baseline, six months, 12 months, and then a year from that, 24 months, the time should be coded as 0, 1, 2, and 4, not 0, 1, 2, and 3. So basically that your unit of time represents the passage of six months. And misspecifying time uh, can dramatically impact your inferences and your coefficient estimates and in general interpretability of the model. This is also um, uh, pretty important in that the measurement that you make should not change over time. You really want to have strong foundations that it would not. Some of these things are measurement related. For example, uh, scanner drift. Something you have control over is the processing algorithms. For neuroimaging specifically, there are lots of things that you may do to avoid biasing your measurements uh, by one particular uh, point in time. For example, you may have three measurements and you might do a registration to an average template within the individual to avoid biasing the effects of that registration towards the first occasion or middle occasion of measurement, something of that sort. So it's a little bit more complicated than just collecting measurements um, that like from test scores or something like that. But even when you think about um, uh, holding those processing algorithms constant, which often means redoing them at every additional time point of the study appropriate to the questions you're trying to answer with that subset of time points, um, and uh, uh, keeping them constant for all of the occasions of measurement. You also should think about the measurement constructs that you use um, themselves. So for example, if you have a measurement construct for, um, and in the case of, uh, of aging, for example, we looked at uh, executive function. So this was constructed as a factor from a variety of sub subtests that were given to individuals. Now, one thing that you wanna be sure of is that if you're trying to measure a process such as mild cognitive impairment with executive function, does that measure mean the same thing um, as someone is changing? And that is an important question that can really um, uh, change some of your uh, conclusions um, that you should consider when thinking about designing a study that looks at time. The ingredients when measuring longitudinal change are often very difficult to, to meet in, in longitudinal studies. This list is by no means comprehensive, but just some things to think about um, when creating a longitudinal study, when designing a longitudinal study. So the first has to do with issues just of recruitment. Uh, when you are looking at a population, there is likely to be dropout, especially the longer your follow-up times. And that dropout is probably not gonna be random. Now, people will drop out because, for example, in an adolescent population, they drop out because they move or they have some other activities that get in the way. They have to be excluded perhaps because they get braces or piercings. Um, this is not random. In, in, in studies of aging, you have th this issue where people become too ill to uh, come in for repeated measures. And that may be very much correlated with the, the decline that you're actually trying to measure. There's issues with acquisition, scanner, there's scanner drift that should be controlled for. Don't upgrade your scanner in the middle of longitudinal study if you can at all help it. Um, motion is an issue, of course, uh, that, that people are aware of, very acutely aware of, especially in developmental uh, studies where kids exhibit different types of motion based on their the group that they may belong to, um, you know, if they have uh, uh, ADD or something like that, or autism. Um, and they also may change the motion that they exhibit as they, as they become more capable of staying in a scanner. So, and these things affect your downstream measures and should be controlled for. 
uh, things that you can control for are you can make sure that you do a reproducible set of software analyses um, for the individual processing level. And you can also control for considering strongly what your model is a priori for how you're going to measure change. This is just an example of some forms of change. So linear, cubic, quadratic, and you can think about things like uh, linear, linear piecewise change, where you have two segments of development and you're modeling each with a different uh, type of curve. Um, so once you have decided upon uh, change and you have enough time points to measure that form of change that you're interested in, then you can think about how you want to ask your questions. So this is just an example of some questions that we might want to ask about change. Um, and I focused here on functional connectivity. This is an area that I did a fair amount of work in. So one thing um, that one might think about is how does change differ across people? So uh, does change in functional connectivity within different networks differ across individuals with anxiety, say? So you can look at measures of how change, the slopes, the trajectories are different in different groups. You can look at things like whether the relationship between, um, whether there is a relationship between change and uh, time variant uh, predictors. So in this case, are there genetic factors that would modify uh, the, the individual trajectories? You can look at the relationship between change in an outcome and change in a predictor. So in this case, do, is there some, cha some um, change in level of stress? Is, is that related with change in functional connectivity between within different networks? I think this is a very exciting set of um, change related questions because you wanna kind of get a sense whether uh, there is a relationship between two variables that might be related. Um, you can look at sort of more data-driven uh, analyses such as whether they're latent groups of individuals with different change direct trajectories. So if you find that some people have you know, a decline and some people have an increase, do these groups of individuals fall out as having these different longitudinal trajectories that might be related then to other variables or, or be other sorts of subtypes potentially? Um, and then finally listed here is, does the trajectory of change predict outcomes? So what can we look at some longitudinal change in some brain measure to predict whether someone will exhibit a certain symptoms? Now, there are two statistical frameworks that I'll talk about today that allow us to answer these questions. So the first is generalized mixed linear modeling, or also known as multi-level models or hierarchical linear growth models. And the second family is uh, latent growth curve modeling. So, and this is sort of a more flexible subset of um, multi-level models. Now this distinction is important because if we look at these questions that we might want to ask about change, we can see that only the first two can be answered by these multi-level models. And the last three um, have to be answered using latent growth curve modeling. One of the big factors, if you look here, is that distinguishes latent growth curve modeling from multi-level models is that it allows you to use change as a predictor and to identify these latent classes of trajectories. So let's talk a little bit about mixed effects and um, models and what fixed effects and random effects are. Um, because the, this mixed effects model is used even when you're looking at just an fMRI study, basically, where you're giving some stimulus and you're modeling um, the effect of that stimulus. So there, fMRI, this is the foundation of fMRI analysis. Some examples of fixed effects are whether somebody is male or female, or whether they're in the treatment or control group. Random effects are the subjects with FRI data and subjects with multiple member me measurements. You assume with fixed effects that all the groups are sampled. And you assume with random effects that not all groups are sampled and that they come in fact from a probability distribution. 
Well, this is important because what we care about with fixed effects are only those groups that you're measuring. Random effects allow you to generalize from the sample that you're looking at to a larger population. So this is typically what we want to do with fMRI analysis is we want to look at the sample of people who we've brought in and generalize that all people will have this, this type of response to this type of stimuli. And in fixed effects, we are modeling only the population mean, but in random effects, we are modeling the variance both within a subject and between a subject between subjects. This is just to show you what, uh, what we mean by, by random intercept and random slope. So suppose that we have some reaction time that varies with, uh, with some form of growth uh, here linear across multiple days. And these shown in green are the individual regression lines of this reaction time. If we model all of this growth with just a random intercept, you can see that this allows the intercept to vary here. Um, so, but the slopes of all of these lines are the same. That's not very realistic and it's not capturing that between subject variability in slope. So if there is a difference between individuals, then you can see that this model will have more error associated with it. Now, if we then it changed the model to include a random intercept and slope. You can see that this is much more like that original set of regression lines and will probably show to have a better fit if we compare it using um, ANOVA or AIC criteria or BIC criteria. Some questions that you can answer when you have three or more time points are uh, using these different types of models, just to get into this a little bit more specifically, is with growth curve models, um, uh, the multi-level models, you can look at whether observations for individuals are predicted for by time. And it's a very flexible type of model for time that you can have. So it doesn't have to be like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. It could be ages by days. And, and you have uh, quite a, a bit of uh, flexibility in expressing that. You can model the intercept and slope as random effects, um, as we just showed. And you can look at how individuals differ in their change over time this way. Again, with latent growth curve models, the intercepts and slopes are latent variables, and the effect of time is estimated from these latent variables. So what you could do is you can look at the relationship of growth parameters, and you can look at the relationships of these different growth processes. Let's talk a little bit about latent growth curve modeling because it really allows you to expand the set of uh, longitudinal questions you can ask. The main uh, feature of latent growth curve models is that you have the concept of latent variables. So there are indicators, things that you measure, that you use in your model, and then you have the concept of latent constructs. And these are, in, these are estimated from the actual indicators. So for example, in a factor analysis, a factor um, is a latent construct that is, is estimated from the individual uh, assessments, for example, that make up that factor. Uh, you can model, as I've said before, you can model the relationship among trajectories of change in multiple constructs. So slopes and uh, um, in, in one measure and in another. And you can use change as the predictor of a different outcome. Now that I've hammered that home, I'll just show you what this looks like um, in, in a traditional sort of SEM, a structural equation modeling syntax. So the way to read this syntax is that the objects in the boxes are the observed variables. Um, and in this case, it's a measurement at baseline, one year, two years, and three years. The ovals are the latent variables that are estimated. The weights of the variables, uh, sorry, the weights of the arrows uh, tell you how to form the equations that go into this. So if we look here, um, for example, the intercept um, is used to, to estimate the baseline as follows. So the baseline is equal to the intercept times one plus the slope times zero. At one year, 
the one year measurement is equal to the intercept times one plus the slope times one and so on. Not shown here would be error terms because you can't fit this exactly. Um, you will obviously have some error in estimating these, these measurements from these constructs. And this arrow here indicates that the intercept and the slope are correlated. Taking this to the next level, this is a parallel process growth model. So it's exactly the same as the previous one in that you have a growth model. You actually have two growth models. And this comes from a paper looking at the relationship between depressive symptoms and post-concussive symptoms in, uh, in people. So here, this is one growth model for the depressive symptoms at baseline one month, three months, and six months. And this is the uh, curve of post-concussive symptoms. So critically here, what you have is the ability to look at the intercepts and how they are related um, and how the intercept of say the post-concussive symptoms predicts the slope, sorry, predicts the slope of depressive symptoms. And likewise, how the intercept of um, uh, depressive symptoms, the baseline depressive symptoms predicts change in post-concussive symptoms. And you can see how these two change score, these two change um, uh, measures, the slopes of these two metrics are correlated and if they're correlated. This is just a chart to sum things up uh, a little bit for looking at these different types of models. And you can take these same kinds of questions that I've been talking about, although I haven't spoken much about rank order change, but you can look at um, what kinds of models are appropriate for what types of uh, things you might want to investigate to form your questions. Let's talk a little bit about the state of the art in fMRI analysis software, because um, this is done, F, uh, fMRI analysis just at it, its very baseline is a repeated measures um, type of analysis done with a mixed effects model, but practically it's approximated a bit. Um, and that is for largely for the computation time and um, uh, statistical issues that are necessary to do this at this large scale, because you're essentially looking at this mass univariate problem of how the bold signal at all of these different voxels is related to your um, explanatory variables. Um, and solving this requires um, uh, a little bit of, of trickery. So uh, in FSL, uh, for example, the first thing that happens is you calculate uh, person level statistics, which are your traditional you know, task effects. So you, use, you create your model and you look at each individual. Um, these estimates are combined to estimate mean effects for each subject. And then you take these estimates, these person level estimates and combine them into a higher, pass them up into a higher level analysis. So when you do a higher level analysis, um, so a you know, two tie point analysis or um, repeated measures ANOVA type of analysis in FSL, you are not taking the raw fMRI data and putting that into a giant model. You are taking these, these, these lower level estimates from each individual. Saves a lot of computation every time you get a new person in to do this and the results are fairly convergent. However, um, one thing about FLAME is that it allows you to estimate random intercepts, which allows that generalization across individuals, but not random slopes. SPM has similar limitations to FSL. Um, and AFNI has taken a little bit of a different approach in some of its, in one of its more modern tools, 3D LME, 3D LME. Um, to get around some of these limitations because uh, you, there are certain things you can't do with FSL. So 3D LME is built around uh, the R package, NLME and LME4. These are mixed effects modeling packages um, and they can be used to encode and analyze pretty much any model that is allowable in either package. Um, and that includes allowing for autocorrelated error structures, um, missing data um, uh, and and whatever you like, except that the in the um, 
in the framework that it that is wrapped around this for AFNI, there's certain things you can't do. You can't uh, control the variance covariance structure. You can't control the outputs very much. You get the 3D images of the F statistics for the model terms, um, and you get T tests for quantitative variables. Um, uh, but uh, and you can generate interclass correlation estimates. But otherwise, it's it's not giving you quite all the full flexibility of R. Nevertheless, um, it's it's a it's a more sophisticated way of analyzing fMRI data um, than than FSL and SPM. I should also mention that there have also been a variety of projects looking at various aspects of the limitations that you have, especially with longitudinal analysis, um, such as the sandwich estimator and the links given here, um, which allows for within subject correlation and longitudinal data, and and there's a bunch of other types of efforts as well um, to extend things. But I would say that probably the AFNI framework is, is one of the more general um, approaches to do that. As the, the assumptions that are made with FSL are, are um, and, and in the GLM in general, are, are kind of restrictive for longitudinal analysis. So one of the big ones is that the correlation between repeated measurements for the same subject is constant, regardless of how far apart in time these measurements are made. So this is, this is often violated because if the time points are closer to each other, typically there's gonna be a greater correlation. Um, Violations of that, those assumptions um, tend to end up in situations where you could potentially increase the risk of false positive claims because there's a greater correlation between closer time points um, and that, that correlation decreases with things that are farther apart. It is not possible to model multiple continuous within and between person predictors between individual predictors, um, and you can't specify within level and cross-level interactions to explain patterns of change over time. Um, so you can't have, for example, random slopes. Um, and it's difficult to deal with missing data. This is just an overall chart of the fMRI tools and what kinds of uh, questions you can ask with these different software packages. Again, not, not completely comprehensive because there's uh, some, some gray areas. I just wanted to go through an example of what uh, a first level model looks like for a single subject and what the, what the relationship is between the, uh, this two-stage approach and R. Um, R is a language that um, is used to, well, by AFNI, for example, it's a, it's a pretty well accepted statistical software package. Many statisticians publish their work in R um, and it's, it's um, generally got, I would say some of the most powerful statistical models available in it, which is why um, I've chosen to use this here to illustrate this. I know that um, probably in this class, a lot of people may be working with Python primarily, um, which I don't think is up to the level of uh, statistical support uh, for mixed effects models that, that R is. So we're sticking, sticking with R here, but you don't need to know any of the details um, just to follow along here. The basic idea here is that if we look at a first level model for a single subject, and we're thinking now about the stimulus and the response, we have Y being the fMRI sing signal at a single voxel, and X is the stimulus EV. Um, beta zero is the intercept, and uh, beta one is the slope parameter. So what we're calculating here is that, um, and there is a typo in my slide, so where, where the slope is should be the slope that's multiplied by X. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I'll change it in the slides. The key thing that we're noticing here is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to estimate uh, the effect of the stimulus. And um, uh, we can do this, we can simulate this as follows here. So in this R code at the bottom, what we've got here is we're setting X to be 
uh, some um, stimulus range, let's let's call it one through 10. So we're not convolving it or anything like that. We're just, just pretending we have this stimulus that changes um, from a low level to a high level. Uh, we will choose a uh, beta weight uh, for, for the slope and for the intercept. Um, so the intercept is 2.8 and the slope is going to be 0.35. And then we just calculate what these values are. So that's y dot fit. And then we can plot these essentially. And that will do that here. So what we have is this is um, the, the true regression line for a single subject. The convolved stimulus is along the x-axis and the bold response that you see is on the y-axis. So, and the slope is the effect of the stimulus. So here we can look at the, the regression lines for five subjects. So we can imagine that each subject is different. So um, each subject has a different slope and uh, we can plot these. So um, here we, sh we see that individual variability. Now um, let's look, we can take this more specifically to look at a, a particular task from Open Neuro. And I mentioned this because the code for analyzing this data, um, simulating what Flame would do using um, a variety of other capabilities, including direct R directly, are included in, a, in the Neuropentalist package that I'll talk about. But this comes from Open Neuro, um, and this is a test retest fMRI uh, data set for motor language and spatial attention functions. So the important thing is that it's got uh, 10 subjects, pretty manageable, two occasions, and a motor task, which is interleaved with fixation cross. So. Um, what Flame would do here is that for each subject, it will estimate an intercept and a slope and within subject variance. And um, that would be your first level analysis. And for the second level analysis, it would estimate the group mean, intercept, and slope. But you're not actually getting just an average. Um, it's, it's basically doing a Bayesian approach, which is a little like weighting the individual estimates. And the weights are a function of the variance. So when you see the... Um, the bar coves and the coves, that's what those files are when you're using Flame and pushing things up. To see how this translates into a random effect model in R using Elmer, which is one of the packages that you can use to model um, uh, mixed effects models, what we can see here is that the uh, brain here is the bold signal at uh, each voxel. In this case, you would do the pre-whitening um, beforehand um, to, to adjust for the autocorrelation of this of the bold signal and all the convolution that you need to of the of the um, uh, of the EVs. But the form of this model is such that you have an intercept and you have a slope, which is finger, that's the explanatory variable. So we're calculating the slope for that. And then you have random effects of the intercept and slope as expressed by the expression one plus finger you know, bar subject. That's just the notation that it's saying. So essentially what we're doing here is we're, we're um, uh, estimating random effects of both the intercept and the slope. Unlike FSL uh, flame, this is not estimating the subject specific intercepts and slopes. You never at any point do this analysis for a single subject. You're only doing this as group means for the intercept and slope and the between subject variance for these intercepts and slope random effects. So it's a little bit different. We can see here what this looks like um, uh, for uh, the intercept the randoms intercept only you're assuming this form of response for each of the five subjects so you're assuming that everybody has the same form of brain response to the stimuli if you allow uh, there to be a random intercept and slope you can see that you're allowing for differences in in both of these and so there can be um, uh, a random effect uh, of, of slope allowing people to have either a stronger or less strong response, for example, to the stimuli. Now, often this isn't really done in fMRI analysis is because there's not necessarily enough data points um, and it's, it's not uh, 
particularly important, um, perhaps. But in longitudinal studies, um, this, this may be something to consider or not, but it's just important, I think, to know um, what you're actually modeling. You can get down and deep and dirty with this if you want to. So for example, you can actually compare models here, um, extending this to include a whole bunch of other covariates, including motion covariates, X, Y, Z, and rotation, and white matter signal, and things like that. And you can see whether or not there is a, a difference for including the random effects or not, whether the model is better fit or not. In, in, in this is just at one particular voxel. So you have this option to do this, of course, at all voxels, or you can, in fact, think about taking the statistics that do come from the individual level and using those and carrying those up into a larger growth model where if what you care about is just looking at the mean response for individual um, from some sort of task, you can carry that through time. So how do you do that? If you want to go and you want to apply some of these more sophisticated longitudinal models more than what is available through the uh, fMRI software that you've got, how do you do that? Um, well, this was the problem that we were facing, um, my colleagues and I were looking at um, a few years ago at the University of Washington. Um, my colleague Kate McLaughlin was looking at a rather um, intense repeated measure study of adolescence and wanting to know, you know, how to apply some pretty creative growth models to look at the relationship of um, changes in, in stress to changes in brain, basically. And um, the thing is, it's, it's pretty possible to do this. It just takes a little bit of time. So we developed this, this package uh, called Neuropointalist. I'll just give a brief overview of what this does. The idea would be that you have repeated measures of fMRI scans, and you do all of the sort of the pre-processing and single subject analysis that you would ordinarily do for each time point, for each person. And then you just pop that into a package that will read the data, split it up for you, and allow you to apply a general model to that in our um, voxel by voxel, sort of counting on the fact that math models have gotten a little bit better. We, can, can, we, we don't have to worry about convergence as much. We've got computers to do things faster. We have clusters. And even if you don't have clusters, you have the cloud available to you, which can make a lot of processing of this type, which is sort of non-critical, available um, pretty inexpensively. This is just a breakdown of what this, uh, what this package actually does, if any of you are curious about this. So this is based here, this example uses nifty files, um, three-dimensional nifty files. So, and I'll get to how that might be different from SIFTY in a second. So the idea would be that you take all of your data sets um, you, which could be multiple time points, obviously multiple subjects. You take all the covariates that go along with that. So subject IDs, time, age, and you take a mask file, which indicates which voxels you actually are going to care about. Because the last thing you want to do is do statistics on voxels that are not particularly um, important. And you read in all of this data and you just reconstruct it, flatten it, essentially, to create two new data arrays. One consists of the voxel data. Um, and with all of the voxels starting from your first to the number of voxels you have in the mask. And the second is the design matrix, which um, consists of the subject IDs and uh, the covariates that you have. Then once you have done that, the critical part is that you write a function that looks at each single voxel individually. So this is very similar to if you did some sort of region of interest analysis. If you pulled out, um, and a lot of people do this, is pull out um, the mean uh, bold signal um, or um, mean statistics from each time point, or if you're looking at structural data, mean uh, cortical thickness for a region. And then you can do your longitudinal model the same way. And it's just like any other variable with all of those other considerations um, for processing um, taken into consideration there. 
So in this case, this model.r file here runs a model um, on, the, on the data and returns whatever, and this is the hard part, whatever it is you want to return. So in this case, it's returning t statistics, um, but that could be anything. You give those variables that return names, and those are basically used to create mask files for you. So this is a very, very flexible format which, in which you can run any type of voxel-wise analysis that you want to do. Um, there's a variety of flags that will cover exhaustively, but basically um, you, can write out, uh, you can write out multiple jobs, and which is how I suggest to do this, and then run those in parallel on some sort of cluster. And then you, you merge all the data together to get the results. The problem with this approach, as I mentioned, is that it takes some time. Um, and uh, you can estimate what this is because if you take a subset of the data and you try your models on that, you can get a feeling for how long they will run um, as long as there's not some huge difference in the conversions of what you're trying to do. Um, they should take, you know, probably approximately about the same amount of time. And then you just multiply that by the number of voxels. And, uh, and that is how you decide, you know, how many you're generating, um, whether the job is feasible at all, and adjust that. So there's several tricks you can do if, if you're interested in doing this. You know, the first thing is to try to look at some regions of interest and then determine whether or not there is an interest in um, doing a, a whole brain type of analysis. This is just the link to the package. Um, I think it's pretty well documented and um, has actually been extended to work with, with a variety of types of schedulers and um, even AWS, and um, you can give it a try. One thing that it has not been extended to yet is to read and write SIFTI files. Um, so if you are working with the SIFTI surface model um, and uh, subcortical structures, it will need a little bit of extension for this um, in a few ways. So reading and writing those files and assembling the data structures is not hard itself. There's a SIFTI toolbox in R and that's something um, pretty straightforward to do. Um, uh, I should mention too that if you are uh, thinking about doing anything like this, it's a really good opportunity to work with a statistician because um, usually it will be pretty straightforward if they have some understanding of fMRI data, MRI data, um, pretty straightforward to understand the issues and the models will be a lot more straightforward in R than they would be with helping to set things up with a um, neuroimaging software package. So I think that for um, sharing reproducibility, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice, uh, nice chance to do that. But one thing that you'll run into is the cluster correction. We've done a lot of work that's documented in NeuroQuantalist in looking at three-dimensional correction. And the most sophisticated way we could figure to do that was to use the ETAC algorithm from AFNI, which allows you to calculate um, to vary the size of your cluster and the P threshold that you use. Um, sort of simultaneously, so you can identify the full set of clusters that would pass um, some uh, false discovery uh, threshold correction level. But um, that is not going to be applicable to a surface model. And so you would have to apply the cluster correction techniques that would be used on the surface um, with SIFTI tools to that. Um, so uh, the, the simple permutation testing strategy that we give that is based on ETAC won't, won't be applicable in this case. So that's just a consideration. This has been a bit of a whirlwind describing a lot of these features. Um, and I don't expect that uh, this is enough to, to, to get home more than a few points, um, which is that the, the class of models that you want to use to look at change as a predictor of other things would be your latent growth models, which are not supported by fMRI tools. You have to do something else. But here are a set of links in the slides that you can look at um, to, uh, to sort of 
reinforce some of these ideas that I've talked about rather quickly. Um, and probably the most important from is the uh, developmental cognitive neuroscience special issue, um, which has a whole set of papers, um, which you will recognize as being some of the source of uh, some of the graphs and um, discussion points in this talk um, that covers really a lot of these things very deeply. So with that, um, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you, bye.